Father. Good morning, everyone. Happy Father's Day. I've got the best gifts of all. My daughter's come to church. And I, that's the greatest gift of all. I couldn't have asked for a better gift, honestly. And I didn't have to force her or anything. She just got up and she said, I'm coming with you to church. So there you go. Uh, uh, it's the cry of my heart that both my children are birthed into his kingdom. And they say when you acknowledge the Lord, he gives you the desires of your heart. And that's a great thing. And we pray that the mother also will come and join us. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's uh, next on his agenda. <laughs> God's got an agenda. Anyway, uh, when Pastor Glenn asked me to speak about fathers, Toll has already given half my sermon, anyway. <laughs> So, when uh, Pastor Glenn, we met for a cup of coffee and he said, oh, I'm going to ask you to speak on Father's Day. And I said, what would you like me to talk about? And he said, Father's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how much information can you give? You know, can you really come up with a whole sermon? Anyway, I had to do a lot of research and then eventually I thought, well, uh, there's only so much you can say. But... Uh, but before I start, so I thought I'd, I wanted to talk a little bit about Roslyn. You see, Roslyn, when Pastor Glenn asked people to speak, you know, he gave us an opportunity to say something, I, um, I was at a total loss for words because there was so much to say and, and, and just, I just couldn't comprehend how suddenly, how, how swiftly God took her away. And it really, uh, I was so saddened by that. And, and, and I was just at a loss for words. And I, I just didn't want to say anything. Uh, and I thought, well, probably I'll get an opportunity later. And then at the memorial service, uh, I never got a chance either. So now is a chance. I, I just want to say a few things. Uh, not so much about Roslyn, but about how we take life for granted sometimes, you know. We live our lives in a world of assumptions. We assume that when we get up in the morning, uh, life is going to be just as it was yesterday. We go to bed and we wake up and we think we're expecting the sun to rise. We go to work and we return at the end of the day and we expect our houses still to be there and all our possessions to be there. And we assume our good health, our interactions with our loved ones and uh, our friends. But then, when illness or tragedy suddenly strikes, our world of assumption crashes in. It collapses. And we search for answers and we ask ourselves why. We blame ourselves sometimes. We blame others. Sometimes we blame God. Of course, when it happens to us personally, then we go through this whole stream of emotions. Numbness. Disbelief. Denial, confusion, guilt, an emptiness, abandonment. And when it happens to someone else, we find ourselves groping for words because we just can't find the words and to express the deep sorrow and the concern that we feel for them. You know, we share their pain and uh, we want to say something meaningful or scriptural in, a, in an attempt to sort of offer comfort. But life has some very profound mysteries and uh, there are no easy answers. And so the impact of death is devastating. It's devastating. It happens without warning or a chance to anticipate what lies ahead. There's no time 
to make amends. There's no time to ask for forgiveness. Sometimes harsh words are spoken. In trivial quarrels, words are said that can't be taken back. It's unfinished business. It can never be transacted. And it remains unsolved. It's, someone once put it like this, it's like a song that hasn't been completed. Today, when they took the collection around, it was Rolson's job to make sure there were over two bags in there. There was only one. I'm not blaming anybody for that. I'm just, it, it was just a reminder of how competent Roslyn was. And to be really honest, we ask ourselves questions like Gideon. When he asked the angel of the Lord, he said this. He said, if God is for us, why is this happening to us? See, but the Bible says in Psalm 139, it says, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in a book before one of them came to be. So we have a start date and we have an end date. And the clock starts ticking from the moment you're born. Life and death are not for us to determine. Why? Because we cannot see what would happen if we lived one day longer, or what would happen if we had one day shorter. It's never too long, it's never too short. It's never too long as we say goodbye to loved ones, and it's never short enough as we watch them suffer. And death is so final. But here's the good thing. That right now, that those who believe in Christ know that death does not shorten our lives. Amen. Amen. It just transports us from one place to the next. Amen. So let me show you that, uh, that God is good all the time, and even though we might not understand his actions, we can trust his heart. We don't see the big picture. Paul put it this way when he spoke to the Romans. He said this, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I see only in part, then I shall see fully even as I am fully Amen. known. Amen. So, you see, in God's plan, every life is long enough and every death is timely. But here's the good thing. While you and I are shaking our heads in sadness, Rosalind is lifting her hands and praising God. While you and I are mourning, and it really tore me up when I heard that she had passed away. It was just, it just, it was like a knife that ripped right through my heart. We might be questioning God, but she's up there praising him. And for those of you who that knew her well, there is no doubting that she heard the best seven words that you and I would love to hear one day. And that is, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen. Okay, so let me just now start off with my message. I haven't even started the message yet. Uh, well, but let me remind you that God doesn't abandon us. He doesn't abandon us in our dark moments. He we can lay claim to the promise that he will never leave us, never forsake us. 
and he gets us through the tough times. Tough times is his favorite word. Through, gets us through. Through the Red Sea, through the wilderness, through the valley of the shadow of death. I'm not saying for one moment it's going to be easy. And I'm not saying for one moment, moment that it's going to be painless. But he does promise to reweave your pain for a higher purpose. Okay? So I just wanted to get that off my chest. So before I start my sermon, let me just pray. I thank you, Heavenly Father. I thank you for this opportunity to speak your word. I pray, Lord, that the words that you give me shall not go astray, but shall accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. I pray for the men who are worthy of your calling, for the fathers of today, Lord, that they may lead us in the way of integrity and righteousness, so that our children may see them as an example worth following. Your word says not to exasperate your children, their children, but instead, may we be a guide and an instructor to them. May we leave a spiritual legacy for them, Lord, that they may come to know the Lord, just as we have. In Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the fathers of today. And my sermon is not going to be that long because... Uh, there's only so much you can say, and most of it has been said already. So, one of the questions I've often asked myself is this. What sort of a spiritual legacy am I going to leave behind for my children? Will my children grow up knowing that their father served the Lord willingly and wholeheartedly? Am I modeling that? For them in my own life. See, there's no better teaching tool in the life of a child than the model of a parent whose life has been surrendered to the Lord. Sorry? Me? Imagine a dad who grows up offering long prayers whenever there's guests over at the house. And yet, when he's alone with his family, he simply says, Thank God for the food, Lord. Now pass me the potatoes and the meat. You know, it doesn't make sense. Or how about a dad who talks in church about the Bible, the most important book in his life, but yet whose children have never actually seen him read it? See, it doesn't take long for a child to grasp that the church is full of hypocrites. We are called as Christian parents to leave a godly legacy. And Moses emphasized this, how important it is to, for a family to love God. So we can put the first slide up. Thanks, uh, Matt. I guess what he said in Deuteronomy, he said, These commands that I give you today are to be upon your hearts, impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home, and when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands, and bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates. You know, we need, as parents, to talk to our children about the Lord. We need to take a stand for God in a culture that hates holiness. If you can leave a godly legacy behind by establishing Jesus Christ at the center of your life, and letting him change the way that you live. But be one, it's not going to be easy. Why? Because he calls you to service. 
He calls you to commitment. He calls you to significantly change your lifestyle. And here's the thing, as the children see your life change, they see something significant and eternal. And they begin to understand the reality of God. And soon they will want them, him to live in their lives as well. It's a legacy that you're going to leave behind. And it's only then that your godly leg uh, let me repeat that, that your godly legacy is established. See, when Joshua's life was coming to a close, he wanted to ensure that his whole country would always remember and revere the Lord. And he reminded them that through, though his ancestors had been pagans, <coughs> God had chosen the Jews to bless all the nations and he encouraged them to remain true to the Lord. And he said this, and I think Tola just repeated it, he said, it, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the God of your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. And then he made a startling statement. He said this, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. See, Joshua knew the importance of remaining faithful to God. Nowhere in Scripture... <coughs> oh, that's loud. <coughs> Sorry. Nowhere in Scripture does God say, try to obey me. God... There's a lot of buzz going around. What's happening here? Is it that spray that's going? Keep going. Okay. Say God is interested in results, not intentions. And he instructs us to raise godly children. You know, at the end of the day... Is that for me? Oh, you're... I knew there was something nice about you. I just couldn't put my finger on it. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Uh, one day we've got to stand before God, eyeball to eyeball. And do you think God's going to be satisfied if we say to him, well, God, we gave it a try. We gave it a try. Now let me remind you, that this message is not just for you, it's for me as well. I, uh, my daughter is here to verify this. My daughter will tell you that when she was younger, I used to sit down with her and we used to read the Gospels. We went through all the Gospels. Uh, it took a long time and then she moved out. <laughs> but uh, we hope that the values that we put in her will eventually pay off. And, uh, spiritual values. And so raising godly children is our responsibility as Christian parents. As you can't leave it to Sharon, who does Sunday school, you can, or Alina, or Thelma, or whoever does Sunday school. Uh, you can't leave it to the pastor. That's not his job. It's your job as a parent. It's a tough job. And sometimes it fosters a feeling of failure. Sometimes you pay the price of unpopularity. Let me tell you that. Uh, I've had my kids tell me, don't push that stuff on me. And it's fine. It's fine. But somewhere along the line, it will come through. It will get through. Uh, why? Because we need to be an example for our children 
by the words and by our actions. It's no good talking to them about the word of God if they've never actually seen you read it themselves. Uh, it's no good talking to them about kneeling and praying if they've never actually seen you do that. Uh, when your children see how highly you value God's perspective on life, in the Bible, then eventually they're going to value its wisdom too. But they must see you interacting with scripture. If they hear you talk about reading the Bible but never see you do it, then they figure that's just another good intention. There's a big difference between good intention and actual obedience. You can't fake a spiritual life and have that example somehow blossom into the lives of your children. And in the book of Moses, uh, Deuteronomy, Moses reminded the people how to become a good Christian. Talk to them about your spiritual experiences. Keep track of answered prayers. Rejoice over them as a family. And as they get older, teach them how to read scripture and learn about the Bible. Let them see that Christianity isn't just what happens on Sunday mornings. It's got to be a constant relationship with you and the Lord. So how do we do that? Well, let's take a look. Uh, could we go back to the first slide, thanks? Yeah. Okay. Notice the word impress. Impress them on your children. Now when Paul was talking, uh, when Paul wrote to the Romans, and he was, uh, no, sorry, in Moses, in Moses, during the time of, my mistake, <laughs> uh, Moses, during the time of Moses, when Deuteronomy was written, uh, Impress was in reference to making pottery. See, when the clay was soft, the potter would use a very sharp tool and he would make a fancy design into the pieces of this colorful stone or clay. And as the clay aged and as it uh, was put out in the sun and started to harden, it took on a permanent uh, What's the word I'm on? Mark, that's the word. I'm glad you're seeing you. <laughs> okay. And so our children are like clay. We are to impress upon them the truth of God while they're still young. And as they grow up, those impressions become part of their lives. And then it says in the passage, talk with them at various times about God. That means talk to them when you get up in the morning, when you go to bed, in other words, let, be God, let God be part of your conversation every day. You know, when you're sharing a meal, when you're traveling in the car, or when you're just sitting around the house. Now, you don't have to turn every event into an object lesson. But if God has blessed you in any particular situation, you need to let your children know that. You need to tell your family, if God has revealed something to you in your quiet time, let them know. Talk about it in your normal conversation. You're a parent all the time, all the time. When you come back from work and you step into the door of your house, and you just, your flesh is tired and you just you're just weak, and you just want to relax, and you feel that you deserve it. But if you get into this habit of zoning out, you aren't really doing your job as a parent. You need to communicate with your children. You need, uh, because as they grow up 
all sorts of problems arise, especially in, t in the teenage years. You need to just turn off the TV and talk. Just talk. Show them that you're com committed to them and you're communicating with them. You don't have to say much. You don't have to probe into their personal lives. But you can guide them along the way. You can. You can be a guide and an instructor. As, as a head of the family, you are the spiritual leader in your home. And I'm talking to the dads here. You find out what they need and what their struggles, what struggles they're facing. And the kids, they need to learn from you. Then Moses speaks of binding signs to the forehead. You remember in those days the Jews would actually put scripture passages in a small box and they tied around their foreheads. So when people saw them, they knew what it stood for. So that same thing applies to us today. As fathers, we need to show our children that we aren't afraid to be recognized as a Christian. Paul says this in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God for the salvation of those who believe. First the Jew, then the Gentile. Why first the Jew? Why? Because they received the word of God first. So the same thing applies to us. Uh, make a stand for what you believe in and don't compromise your values no matter what it is. Let your children know that you're not ashamed and you're proud to be identified with Christ. You know, I caught up with Pastor Glenn a few weeks ago over a cup of coffee in Parkmore and we just to discuss opinions about certain issues in the church and uh, after a little chat, Glenn said, why don't we pray? And he bowed our heads and he prayed. And uh, and he was not ashamed to be, it didn't matter who was sitting there, it didn't matter. But he was not ashamed to be identified with Christ no matter where he was, or even if it felt out of place. And I thought that was awesome. I thought that was awesome. Then Moses talks about writing God's truth on the, de on the doors and gates of our homes. Think about it. When people come into your house, what do they see? What books do they see on your shelves? What movies are sitting alongside your DVD player? Are the movies full, filled with violence or pornography or any sexual content? Uh, my, my daughter will, will verify this. My, my daughter, when we go to see a movie and, and I say, what's going? And she say, oh, that's a great movie, but I don't think you like it, Dad. <laughs> I don't think you like it. Why? Because she knows the stand that I make. And I'm not boasting, I'm not boasting here, but it's, it's a path that I've followed. And it's, and it's passed on to my kids, you know. And she'll tell you, Dad, I don't think you're going to like this book. I don't think you're going to like this movie. Don't watch it, you know. And I, I think to myself, well, that's good, that's good. She's getting the message. <laughs> okay. Uh, is your home a temple for the Lord? And people walk into your house. Uh, I, I, in some homes, is, uh, some of our friends' homes, is littered with idols and, you know. Uh, I don't want to get into the subject directly now, but uh, I, I, I don't believe, I think uh, my home is, is filled with biblical scripture on the walls, you know. I mean, we have plaques with, with biblical scripture. Because uh, I don't believe that any other thing can, is, a, is a true representation of God. And that's where some of the churches go wrong. 
But uh, that's a different issue, and I don't want to get into that just right. But as a responsibility as a parent, your responsibility doesn't end just because your child grows 18. They're your kids, and they're your children forever. Uh, and uh, they're going to remain your legacy. Don't give up on them. Just because they've grown up and gone past the age of 18 doesn't mean you don't exist as a parent. Speak into their lives. Let them understand where you're coming from. Let them realize that this earth is not the end. Death is not the end. You have to stand accountable for the life that you live one day. You're a steward of God's resources. You've been given privileges as a child of God. You need to use them wisely. Uh, my wife and I myself are still struggling with issues with uh, my other daughter. But we're determined not to give up. We're determined not to give up. And we pray. And we pray. And uh, I firmly believe that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I firmly believe that. Uh, I thank the church for their continual prayer in my life, in the lives of my family. And, and, and that's a promise that I stand on every day of my life. All of time is linked together in God's minds. He sees the entire scene from beginning to end and into eternity. And it's our job as parents to raise godly children. The question you have to ask yourself is this. Have I done enough for my children to understand the Lord? Have I spoken to them about stories about God? Have I set a godly example before them so that they may know what a mature Christian is? We, as fathers, are the key to godly children. Just because you send your kids to Christian schools is not a guarantee that your child will be a follower of Christ. You have to set the example. The question is, do you love the Lord with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength? Are you leaving a legacy of godly children? They're the ones to whom you're going to pass the baton on to in this race. They are the ones who are going to start a new generation of godly people living in an ungodly world. At times, like I said, you will pay the price of unpopularity. But the fruits of your efforts will be seen as the godly values is set in your children will one day soon blossom. Thank you. Thank you. Please join us for a cup of tea and a cup of coffee. And a special breakfast for Father's Day, is it? Thanks, Annalise.